right. So thank you very much, Matt, for the introduction. Um, and I'd also like to thank Mola, um, my employers, for funding my trip to TAG um, very kindly. I would not have been able to come if they hadn't done that. So it's, uh, it's very nice of them. Thank you, Mola. Um, the work I'm going to present today is based on a paper I've just finished drafting for an edited volume resulting from a 2021 symposium at Stockholm University, which I did, I mentioned that earlier as well, um, fragmentation in context. So I'd like to thank the organisers of that symposium, uh, Anna Sorman, Astrid Nutterman and Marcus Piltrum for allowing me to write it and providing their valuable feedback. So if anyone has any comments um, about the contents of the paper, please do let me know um, and I can just quickly sneak them in to the paper before I hand it in tomorrow. <laughs> so th this paper is about um, the fragmentation of human-made things in Iron Age Britain. My research focuses on Iron Age finds, particularly decorated metalwork. One angle of inquiry I've been exploring over the past few years is the way that metal objects were used, repaired and modified. And today I'll speak about the reuse of components um, in repairs and modifications and to constitute new objects. I'll be discussing this process as dismantling and reassembly. And the discussion of um, this phenomenon will rest on what the differences and similar similarities are between dismantling and more traditional forms of fragmentation. But first, I want to just situate these processes within the wider landscape of fragmentation in Iron Age Britain. These images show publications that discuss Iron Age fragmentation with a focus on human remains. Um, the fragmentation of human bodies has formed a rich theme in Iron Age research. Um, but I think that the fragmentation of human-made things in the Iron Age has received a bit less attention. Please tell me if you think I'm wrong about that. Um, Either way, I think it's important to see all of these things as parts of the same picture. The vast majority of Iron Age finds broken when we find them. Uh, this can be for a whole range of reasons, uh, site taphonomy, uh, the method of recovery for more fragile finds, um, and so on. Many were also broken uh, in the Iron Age before becoming part of the archeological record. But working out whether they were deliberately broken or accidentally, uh, accidentally broken is often challenging. Taking cues from Matt's work on Bronze Age metalwork, I think that experimental archaeology um, is, is a really useful way of finding out about the methods and force required to break certain types of finds. And I think this is probably uh, perhaps the best way to, to help to distinguish between accidental, accidental and deliberate breaks. While direct finds-based evidence of deliberate breakage of human-made things is rare in assemblages from Iron Age Britain, the context can tell us much about the uses and purposes of fragments themselves. For example, uh, Melanie Giles has written about the inclusion of soft-fired ceramic jars in graves uh, in middle, middle to late Iron Age East Yorkshire. Some of these are near complete, um, but partially or wholly missing uh, their rims or upper bodies. Were these vessels, therefore, perhaps fragmented as part of the funerary event? Um, and, and were some sherds retained um, above ground by mourners, perhaps as mementos? Um, Hill and Horn, in their work on pottery from Wardy Hill in Cambridgeshire, have written about examples of the special treatment of incomplete, unusual, latin decorated ceramic vessels um, in East Anglia and the East Midlands during the late Iron Age. This vessel um, that I've shown a picture of there uh, was old at the time it was deposited, um, but its missing sherds were, were not found. It may have been curated as an incomplete uh, vessel, um, but a bit special vessel, or perhaps even broken to generate sherds that when, then went on to have other uses. So whether or not objects were broken deliberately, um, fragments seem to have had particular purposes in Iron Age Britain. I'm showing some pictures here of Danbury, um, a site with lots of pits and pit deposits, but really I'm, I'm thinking broadly about the deposits from all over Britain in the Iron Age, and indeed the Bronze Age and Romani British period as well, um, that are seen as special or odd, for example. As Duncan Garrow has warned, we should be careful not to overinterpret these and ascribe too much intentionality to deposits that could have been uh, could have built up in a more ad hoc manner. But I think there are lots of deposits out there that make specific uses of fragmented objects, sometimes in combination with fragmented animals and people. 
Something I'm interested in doing in my general work is examining and critiquing dichotomy between shiny Iron Age art and non-shiny Iron Age craft. While there are lots of differences between the two types of objects shown here, um, I don't think that we should judge and compare their decorative capacities based on our own biases about the materials they're made from. But having said that, some of the Iron Age metalwork I'm talking about today has a characteristic not shared by pottery or coin stones, for example. They are composite objects made from multiple parts. Of course, we need, um, we need to consider the nested scales of assemblage that are always at work. Um, a composite object um, could mean a lot of different things in assemblage terms. So in that context, I'm considering composite objects to be groups of multiple um, individually made components that function as an object when joined physically together in a particular way. I think that perhaps the development of complex composite object types during the Iron Age introduced new opportunities for fragmentation, and I'll talk a little bit more about these now. So now to a few brief case studies from East Yorkshire in the northeast of England. Uh, this is the region um, on which my PhD research focused and it includes some interesting um, evidence for the dismantling and reassembly of different types of objects in the Middle Iron Age. The Grimthorpe Shield was activated in the 19th century from the grave of a young male, which also included a sword in its scabbard and a number of bone points. Although it's, un uh, it's usually referred to as a single object, it actually consists of a number of fittings pictured here. Their exact locations in the grave weren't recorded, um, due, due to the, the early date of the excavation. So we can't know for sure whether, um, we can't know for sure whether they were joined to a shield backing when deposited. But Ian Stead has suggested based on accounts of its discovery that they probably were in his reconstruction, which is on the slide. And I think a few rivets collected from the burial fill as well, I think um, add weight to that idea. So interestingly, I found that the two crescent-shaped fittings shown there show far more wear and tear than the other fittings. They've been broken, damaged, and repaired, and the number of um, number and placement of the rivet holes around on these fittings, as well as the wear around them, suggests they were torn from at least one shield backing before being reattached to another. Um, and the boss and ribs, conversely, show no signs of wear. So there's a, a lot more I can say about this shield, um, but I don't have time. So in, an, in a nutshell, it was made either from the fittings of at least two shields or from a mix of older and newer fittings. Chariots are perhaps the ultimate Iron Age composite object, made from multiple durable fittings as well as wooden components and also including other materials such as leather. The work of uh, Melanie Giles and chariots from East Yorkshire and its surrounding counties has um, suggested that some of the chariots we see in chariot burials were collections of parts of different vehicles. In East Yorkshire, they were generally uh, dismantled be before being deposited in, in graves. But one example from Ferry Fryston over the border in West Yorkshire, um, which is pictured on the slide, was wheeled into the grave hole. Um, it was assembled shortly before burial, consisting of varied fittings, including differently sized wheels on which it wouldn't have been able to drive very far at all, <laughs> as you can imagine. Sets of metal chariot fittings also provide more subtle evidence, perhaps, for the dismantling and reassembly of chariot yoke assemblages. Garon Gosden have commented on the diverse designs of the Kirkburn chariot fittings, which contrast with other sets I've examined, um, which do seem to have been made as sets. And the set of turrets um, or rain rings from the Garton Station chariot include one much larger central turret going beyond the usual size gradient that we see in these yoke assemblages. Um, and this was also differently constructed and decorated. So was this turret perhaps swapped in from another set? This slide again draws on, on Mel Giles's work. The ring-headed pin um, on the left is set with a series of cylindrical coral beads which had once been strung as a necklace. And, as, and Giles also, suggests, also suggests that sets of beads, such, such as the one shown here, um, which probably formed a necklace, may have been formed from beads um, coming from multiple sources, um, 
beads making and ideal kind of ideal objects for exchange, handing down, bequeathing, that kind of thing. So I'm going to very briefly show a few examples of dismantling and reassembly from other parts of middle to late Iron Age Britain outside East Yorkshire to show that I think this is probably part of a wider phenomenon um, that I think deserves further study. Starting with the Tours Pony Cap, which is at, just down the road at NMS, I think. Yeah, it's, yes. yeah, it's in there. Um, it's a, a hat for a horse, uh, which had two exuberant uh, horns added to it at some point during its usage in the Iron Age. And the horns may have had previous functions, possibly as fittings for the ends of a chariot yoke. The grotesque talk was deposited um, in the late second or early first century BC as part of a series of hoards in Snettisham, Norfolk. It was already old when it was deposited and it's been repaired in multiple ways using fragments from other talks. These repairs have been discussed um, both as the result of hasty repairs by a non-specialist by Tess Mackling and Roland Williamson, and also by Jodie Joy as a longer term accumulation of visible modifications. Cauldrons were also very long lived objects in the Iron Age, often showing evidence for long term use and repair, as well as repairs made to remediate flaws arising during uh, processes of manufacture. And you can read about them um, again in the work of Jodie Joy. From Joy's work, we know that cauldrons were quite often dismantled. And I think it's quite possible that bits from dismantled cauldrons were used to, to mend other cauldrons. Kind of makes sense. But we need to figure out ways of uh, proving or disproving that idea. When I say we, I mean me. <laughs> okay, um, sword scabbards, again, um, are long-lived objects, often with repairs. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to discuss this one in detail because I'm wary of time running out. Um, but maybe we could come back to it. But I did want to end on this um, really interesting object, um, a picture, it's a miniature shield from the Salisbury Horde, Wiltshire. And this is an object that I've been interested in for a long time. Um, it's heavily repaired and patched together. The repairs you see are Iron Age repairs, although there are some modern ones around the back. Um, but presumably it's never been used in any kind of combat, um, being just a few centimetres in length. How mysterious. Um, perhaps though, we can see it as a mini representation of the concepts involved in the composition of a full-size shield from bits and pieces of other shields, just like the Grimthorpe example I talked about earlier. There are multiple different reasons um, why the dismantling and reassembly of composite objects might have happened. Importantly, the reuse of components from dismantled objects, um, perhaps just old objects that have gone out of use, will have been useful as um, useful re for repairs and as replacements for broken components. Reuse, therefore, will have saved time and resources. However, I think that um, evidence suggests that the reuse of components, in some cases, may have served other functions as well, relating to the historic values of some of these composite objects, which were often um, very long lived as uh, perhaps heirlooms or antiques, adding to their visible histories of use. So coming back to the, the main sort of question in this paper, um, what is the difference between fragmentation and dismantling? On the face of it, the process of carefully dismantling a composite object with a view to reusing its components is very different from the forceful fragmentation of an object. However, as the work of Chapman and Gaidaska has shown us, fragmentation can also result in fragments that are purposefully created for use beyond the event of fragmentation. Fragmenting and dismantling, therefore, both produce components for incorporation into new assemblages. So in answer to the question of the difference between these two things, I think that perhaps the dismantling I'm describing is a form of fragmentation, adapting those same concepts um, for use in an assemblage of composite, um, complex composite objects. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>